All right, title of the sermon this morning is Things to be Thankful for. Things to be Thankful for. So I want to remind us this morning how blessed we are. And uh, not everything we're going to mention this morning may apply to every single person in the room. But I thought it would be a, a good opportunity for me to talk about and uh, for us to remember and reflect on things that we should be thankful for. Sometimes we get a little negative, but um, we need to be reminded that we need to think about the things that are positive and we need to give thanks for all things. So Ephesians 5 tells us here, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now sometimes we don't always know why things come our way we think how can i be thankful for all this terrible th stuff that is happening in my life you know oftentimes the good things that happen in our life uh, we are often we can easily be thankful for but often we don't we always think of the negative things that happen to our life and say we're not thankful for these things but remember suffering hard times these things come into our life and are allowed by god to mold and to make us more into the image of Jesus Christ. So we don't want to look at negative things in our life and not be thankful for them. And in fact, you know, the Bible talks about even God chastising us from a loving Father. Things, trials and temptations, building us, growing us. So we need to make sure that when bad things happen in our life, we don't miss the lesson that God is trying to teach us and trying to grow us as believers on Jesus Christ. So not only in Ephesians 5, you see, giving thanks always for all things like we read in first thessalonians 5 18 this is the other side this is why we read first thessalonians 5 today verse 18 in everything give thanks for this is the will of god in christ jesus concerning you first thessalonians 5 so we see in ephesians 5 giving thanks always for all things and then you can think about 1 Thessalonians 5 is in everything give thanks. So you're not only giving thanks for the things individually, but you're also giving thanks in every situation. Whether you find yourself in a positive situation or in a negative situation, you should still be thankful to the Lord. So we need to give thanks. We're actually commanded, right? This is the will of God in christ jesus concerning you now some people have i just mentioned this some people have this idea that the will of god is something mysterious something that we don't know what it is something that we have to beg god to reveal to us what his will is and that is not the case the bible actually mentions what the will of god is in some things the will of god is what he wants right it's not just some nebulous thing that we don't know about right the will of God is the things that he wants. And he actually tells us in the Bible. And one of them is, in everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. There are the, sometimes these statements that clear, clearly state what the will of God is. Just like the will of God for a woman. Then we got the will of God to abstain from fornication in other places as well. So 1 Thessalonians 5. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So today I want to talk about some things to give thanks for we want to be like job you know when job was going through hard times you know job is the book that we look to and here's the example when we go through hard times and we often don't know where we find ourselves asking why am i going through this what is the reason you know job went through all these terrible things he lost everything lost family his wife turner he lost his health he lost everything except his life and if you know the book of Job, so you read the book of Job and you know why Job lost all these things. But do you know that Job never knew why he lost all these things? You know, you read through the book of Job, he's talking with his friends, they're wondering why God is doing this to him. And, you know, finally when God reveals himself, you know, God doesn't tell him, oh, actually, I let Satan do all these things too. You know, maybe we found out later, you know, I don't know who actually wrote the book of Job. I don't know if Job actually wrote it or somebody else wrote the story about Job. You know, maybe he found out later when he read the, the, the book of Job. But you'll notice at the end of Job, like God doesn't actually tell him why. He just says, do you know this? Do you know that? And Job just goes, like, you know, like God can just be God. He, he just has to learn to trust God. But look at Job 1 verse 20. Then Job arose and rent his mantle, shaved his head, fell down upon the ground and worshipped. 
See, would you have that sort of response when you go through hard times? Would you rise up, you know, I mean, you know, don't necessarily shave your head, fall upon the ground and worship God, give thanks, praise Him, lift Him up? If you were going through the things Job was going through, and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So you can see here, Job did not derive his faithfulness to God. He did not, not derive his joy. He didn't derive his pleasure from the things that he owned, because when they were taken away, he said, Hey, the Lord hath given, the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. See, in all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. So we need to be careful when we go through hard times, when we go through suffering, when we go through things that we don't expect from God, that we do not charge God foolishly and say things foolish about God. You know, either cursing God, God forbid, or saying, you know, God doesn't care about me, God doesn't love me, where is God? Things like that, right? And those thoughts often come into our mind when we are going through hard times. Look at what it says in 2 Timothy 3. It's talking about the last days. You know, we're in the last days now. Things are getting worse and worse. This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. Now, does this not describe the kind of self-glorifying, self-pleasure, living for yourself life that we see today in the world? As we read through some of these attributes, you should be reflecting, not just saying, oh, look how evil and wicked the world is. You should be thinking, man, are there any attributes in here that describe me? And I need to repent of those. I need to get those out of my life. I need to stop being what God is saying is, is uh, these wicked people that will wax worse and worse in the end times. Men shall be lovers of their own selves. Right? Because what is love? Love is others. Esteem others better than yourself. Covetous. Right? Materialistic superficial artificial you know it's all about the physical boasters proud blasphemers you know, speaking against god disobedient to parents look at this unthankful unthankful right it's like it's like people are ungrateful what they have unthankful unholy without natural affection truce breakers false accusers, incontinent. Right? So incontinent is, is, is not necessarily talking about you know, the health one, but incontinent is talking about um, you know, like having, not being able to control like lusts, a bit like lasciviousness. Fierce, despisers of those that are good. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God. Does that describe you? That's sort of where, where we are, in, uh, in the, where we live, you know, where we are prosperous, and we have more than we could ask for. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. You know, you're more excited about your holiday than you are about coming to the house of God. You, you think more about work you know, than you do about God. You, you, you're, you're willing to move your schedule for something that you enjoy, but you will not move your schedule for God's kingdom. Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such, turn away. Unthankful is an attribute of the end times. People are going to be ungrateful. We don't want to be ungrateful. So the world is a fallen place. Right? So sometimes it's good to stop and to think about things to be thankful for. And the Bible actually encourages us to think on the positive things. Philippians 4, look what it says here. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just and fair, whatsoever things are pure, so no sin, Whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. These are the things we should be thinking of, our mind should be consumed on. We sh you know, yes, we can know about negative things and 
try and figure them out, try and resolve them, but that's not where our mind should be dwelling. We're actually in sin if we're doing that, right? Because the Bible's telling us, hey, well, the things that we really should be thinking on are the things that are true and honest and just and pure and lovely, not the things that are uh, sinful, right? The things that are necessarily negative. Good report, virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. So what I want to talk about today, I'm going to uh, give you eight things to be thankful for. And I know not all of them will apply to all of you, but I know uh, at least one of them will, I'm sure. So the first thing that we ought to be thankful for is life. You know, are you thankful that you're even alive? I mean, you get to, you get to experience life. You get to do things that, you know, what about the, the millions of babies that have been killed in the womb that have not even taken their first breath? They have not even been able to experience this world that God created. So we have to be grateful for the fact that we have life. You say, but Victor, but my life sucks. Hey, at least you have a life to suck, right? Some people don't even have a life that can suck, but at least we have a life that can suck. At least you have an opportunity to make it different, right? You can make the most of the life you have. And having life enables us to even experience the other things I'm going to cover in this sermon. Right? So just be grateful that you're even alive today to experience these things. And you know, the fact that you're alive, that you have life, comes from God. So this is why when the fact that you're alive, the fact that you wake up in the morning, you know, we, we take that for granted, that we go to sleep and tomorrow we, we're going to wake up and live another day. But we should also give thanks to God that when we wake up in the morning, we have another life to live, another opportunity to serve Him, another opportunity to earn rewards in heaven, another opportunity to make a difference in our life, in the lives of others, and for the kingdom of God. Acts 17. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that He is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though He needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed, the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord. Right? So why has he given us life? Hey, here's the word, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him, and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your poets, our own poets, have said, for we are also his offspring. So this is Paul, you know, preaching on Mars Hill to the Athenians. He's saying, hey, God is the one that gives us life, the one that sustains us, right? So whenever we are, we are alive, we have to give thanks to God that he's even sustaining our life. Ecclesiastes 12, 7, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God. Look at this. Who gave it? Hebrews 1. God who had sundry times. Sundry means, you know, diverse, right? Sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. So in the Old Testament, he's sending prophets. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. So that's why in the New Testament, the word is spread through the apostles. Right? Given by Jesus Christ, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. Sometimes you wonder, I remember Heidi brought this up once, and I was like, what is he saying? Like, he made the world. Isn't there only one world? Are they like into you know, a different world? Well, the Bible talks about worlds like the old world, like Noah's day. So it's, it's kind of like ages sometimes when he talks about the world. Like the old world, it refers to Noah. So um, there's that as well, as well as, I guess, the, the world to come. By whom also he made the world, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Do you realize that God holds everything together you wonder like what you know scientists can't figure out like what actually holds like an atom together where does the energy come from and then you know then they split the atom like an atom bomb and it's like boom like this energy that's just like so the bible says hey god is holding all things together by the word of his power right so the fact that you survive 
you live. You know, he's, our breath is in his hand, it describes in Daniel. In whose hand thy breath is. If God wanted to take away your life, he would just have to stop and that's it for you. Right? So the fact that you're alive, you ought to be thankful for that, that you have life from God. So yeah, maybe your life isn't ideal. Maybe your life isn't the way you t wanted it to turn out to be. But you have life. And if you have life, you have time still to make a difference, make a change. Maybe it just need, Maybe all that needs to change in your life is a change in perspective. Right? If you saw things differently, maybe you would um, not, have, not be so negative. So first thing to be thankful for, life. Second thing to be thankful for is our health. Now I know people have health challenges, but when we compare it to some of the people in the Bible that we see, we enjoy a lot of health in comparison. And it's something to be thankful for. Look at John 5. Let's look at two examples of people with health challenges. And uh, you know, they were you know, blessed enough, lucky enough to be healed by Jesus. But we, have, we find ourselves in a situation you know, better than theirs when they were going through their tough times. John 5, 2. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk. folk impotent. See, these are people that can't walk. Of blind people they can't see. Halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. So you this morning, you know, you may be suffering from some health challenges here and there, but to the extent of the health challenges that you could have, you ought to be thankful for the health that you do enjoy. Right? So we, as Christians, really should be optimistic people. You know, as Christians, we shouldn't be looking at the glass half empty. We should be looking at the glass half full. So we don't necessarily focus on, yeah, sometimes we need to deal with our health challenges, but sometimes we get so caught up in them that we don't give thanks for the health that we do enjoy. Right? Not sometimes like these people. Like these people have it a lot worse than the people in this room. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water, Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. So this is such an interesting thing that there was actually like a supernatural pool in Jerusalem here, right, called Bethesda, and they just waited for an angel to come down and stir up the water. I don't know if you're understanding what's being said. Here. The angel would stir up the water, and the first one that went into the water after the angel stirred it up would be healed of whatever ailment they had. And it obviously happened enough times because over the life of this guy that's been waiting there, he's seen it happen, but he can't get in quick enough. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity. Look at this. 30 and 8 years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, and took up his bed, and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. So this man is not even able to walk. So do you, do you sometimes give thanks that you're able to move about freely? You, know, you were here this morning, like none of us are in wheelchairs this morning. You know, maybe the people that are in wheelchairs can relate to people that can't just move around freely. But for the health you do enjoy, I mean, you were able to walk here this morning, you are able to move around how you wish. Not everybody enjoys that sort of freedom and that sort of ability. Are you thankful for that? John 9, verse 1. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born Blind. See, sometimes people think that it's, there's always something that causes. It's always like a, a sin or something that he did. They're saying, hey, why is he blind? Was it something his parents did wrong or something he did wrong? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents. Look at this. But that the works of God should be made manifest in him. See, sometimes there isn't always a reason why you have a problem health-wise. Sometimes there isn't always a problem, like, like uh, Paul, when he had the thorn in the flesh. 
He didn't know why. He asked God to remove it from him three times. But why was he given that thorn in the flesh? The messenger of Satan to buffet him so that he would not be exalted, right? So that he would be humble because of the revelations that were given to him. And he had to learn that God's grace was sufficient for him. So sometimes you're being taught that lesson as well. But if you don't have these same health challenges, be thankful for that. Be thankful that, hey, look, I was not born blind like this person in John 9. I mean, do you take it for granted sometimes that you're able to see, that you're able to read, that you're able to see other people, that you're able to work with your eyes? I mean, we take these things for granted and we ought to give thanks for them. Our five senses. So we have seeing. What about hearing? The fact that you can hear my voice this morning. You don't have to read it off a screen. You don't have to have something plugged into your ears. You don't have to, you know, you know, use Braille. You know, some, some people, they, they have to, you know, uh, you know t touch things in order to, to, to uh, read because they can't necessarily hear. Seeing, hearing, the ability to touch, you know, the ability to taste. I mean, when you eat your food, you give thanks to God and say, I thank God that I'm able to enjoy this meal. I'm able to enjoy this food. I can actually smell it. I can taste it. And I enjoy eating it. Some people, they have a loss of appetite. And maybe it's not until you lose the ability of your five senses that maybe you'll start to appreciate what you have. The ability to eat and drink. Look at what it says here in Mark 8. For what shall it profit a man if he gain, shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Now, let's compare this to Mark 9, where Jesus is talking about people being thrown into hell. And notice what he talks about here. He says, If thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched. What I want you to sort of focus on as I'm comparing these passages, the point I'm trying to make, is obviously God is saying, hey, the soul is worth more than all things in the world. But he says, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So like he's in Mark 9, he's going to give some examples of things that are super, super valuable to you. That he's saying, hey, you would rather lose this in order to be saved that that was the case. But he's not talking about material possessions. And oftentimes we think about the material possessions we don't have and we're not thankful for the life we live and yet we take completely for granted the things that are the most valuable to us. That if we were to lose, we would give all the money in the world to get back. I mean, wouldn't you? I mean, wouldn't you give up all the riches, all the houses, all, all the holidays, everything, if you could just see again? If you could have your hands back, if you could move? Now, people don't realize how valuable the things they have, how valuable their health is until it's gone. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. So Jesus is actually quoting Old Testament passage in Isaiah where he's talking about hell and talking about their worm, where their worm doesn't die and the fire is not quenched, right? Because you go to hell, you burn... And the, and the fire does not consume you. It doesn't consume the worms either that are eating your body. And if I, uh, that having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not. Right? So their worm, who? The people that are in hell. Their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, seize the ability to better walk around, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched. So Jesus is not teaching here what people have to do in order to go to heaven. What he's saying here is this is how important it is that you turn from trusting in your works and get saved. And if your hand or your eye or your foot is causing you to go to hell, hey, it would be better to not have it. That's, he's warning us about the terribleness of hell than having two feet to be cast into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched often the bible repeats things to make a point to emphasize things and jesus here is repeating it three times and if thine eye offend thee pluck it out 
It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell. And to cast into hellfire where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. So give thanks for your health that you are able to come here this morning, that you're able to talk, that you're able to see, that you're able to hear. You know, those of you staying for lunch afterwards or whether you're going to go eat out somewhere else, give thanks that you're able to enjoy this meal, that you even have an appetite and you enjoy the food that you eat. These are all blessings from God. All right, number three, so we have life. Give thanks for life. Give thanks for the health that you enjoy. Give thanks for the necessities that God provides to you. Give thanks for the base, having the basic necessities. Matthew 6. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Notice the Bible doesn't say it's difficult to serve God and mammon, but if you're very disciplined, it's, easy, it's possible to do. Right? No, no. You cannot serve God and mammon. This is talking about the purpose of your life. You know, if you make money the purpose of your life, you, you won't be serving God. Right? But if you make God the purpose of your life, sure, you're, you can make money in your life, but it's about what are you serving? What is your God? You cannot have two at the top. And oftentimes, you know, you can tell when people have got, uh, money as their God because they start to compromise on the things of God in order to make money, in order to keep a certain level of finances, right? And this is why. You cannot serve God and mammon. Why? Because these some will often conflict. You cannot serve God and mammon. It's not that it's difficult to serve God and mammon and not everyone is able to do it. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life. Right? Now, this does not mean, take no thought for your life does not mean that you're not responsible. Right? Bible, we have to be responsible. This is talking about not being worried about it, careful about it. Careful meaning full of care. Right? Not careful in terms of responsible. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. It's not the life more than meat. And the body more than raiment? Isn't your life about more than just food and clothing? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Now verse 33 is often a verse that is used inappropriately or out of context. It says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. I don't know if you've ever heard this verse being used to just talk about success and talk about having a great life and talking about you know, getting the, the house you want and the holiday that you've dreamed about and the job that you've always wanted. All these things shall be added. It's not, it's not what this verse I mean, what did we just look at? What is the promise that if you seek first the kingdom of God, that should be our priority. We seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Right? So this is not just, oh, I love God is his first, and his righteousness, actually obeying him, right? keeping his commandments. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Right? We're seeking to be obedient to the faith and all these things shall be added unto you. What? It's the food and the clothing. Your basic necessities will be taken care of because anything on top of that is just a bonus. Now what I want you to think about this morning is we read this passage and we think, what's there to worry about? Because obviously Jesus is preaching here 
to people that didn't even know where their next meal was going to come from, that only had one change of clothing. For the people in this room, that's not you. You're not wondering about what you're going to eat for lunch. You're not wondering about whether you're going to have dinner tonight. You're not even wondering whether you're going to have something to eat a month from now. I mean, a lot of us have so many clothes and we don't even wear them all. I mean, I'm not even that big on clothes and I have more clothes than I can wear. Right? So I'm not worried about not having clothes. I mean, isn't that something to be thankful for? You know, next time when you think about it, when you're complaining about how bad your life is, I mean, is it as bad as this? You've got food, you've got clothing. The Bible says here in 1 Timothy 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And look at this, and having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. See, so if you have food and clothing, the Bible says you can be happy. You should be happy when you have food and clothing. And you ought to be seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And you'll never have to worry about these things, even people that can't afford food and clothing. They, God is telling them you shouldn't have to worry about these. How much more or less should we complain about life when we're not, we're not worried about where the next meal is going to come? You know, often we eat too much. And we have the opposite problem. We have to like, you know, limit how much we eat so we don't become obese, right? We have, to, we have too much food. Deuteronomy 8, look at this. Deuteronomy 8, when thou hast eaten and art full, and I'm sure that's, people can, in this room can relate to this. Look at this. Then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes which I command thee this day. Lest when thou hast eaten and art full and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein. See, when your life is great, verse 13, and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply, your business is doing good, thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, right? All your investments are doing well, all that thou hast is multiplied. Then thine heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led thee through that great and terrible wilderness wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, where there was no water, who brought thee forth water out of the rock of the flint. So this is likened to our salvation, right? In the New Testament, who saved you from an eternity of hell, who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee, that he might prove thee, to do thee good at thy latter day. And thou say in thine heart, my power and the might of mine hand had gotten me this wealth. See, so when your life is doing so great, is, did we find ourselves doing that? Hey, look at all the great work I've done. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, that he swear unto thy fathers, as it is this day. So not only should we just thank God for our basic necessities, but our, most of us in here you know, have work, you know, we have an income. We have way more than what God has even promised. We have a house to live in. We have a car. You know, we have things you got to get us around. Hey, don't let this lift us up to the point where we forget God. And we are chasing things rather than chasing God. You know, we're not wondering where we're going to sleep tonight. Jesus did. Jesus said, hey, you know, he says the foxes have holes. The birds of the air have nests. The Son of Man had not where to lay his head. I mean, you have, you have more than the Lord Jesus Christ you know, when he was on this earth. So, you know, I'm thankful. You know, I'm thankful to have, you know, you know well-paid work, even whilst this church isn't large enough to support me full-time. You know, thank God that, you know, being able to provide an income for my family, um, these, are, these are things that we should be thankful for, our basic necessities. Number four, our country. Thankful for our country. It's like, Victor, I can be thankful for Australia. What's going on? You know, yeah, it's not perfect. You know, our country is a lot of problems, corrupt politicians, a lot of agendas going on. Um, you know, I don't doubt about that. But, you know, we ought to give thanks. Like with our health, we ought to give thanks for the freedoms that we are able to enjoy, you know, while they're still around. And we don't do anything about it, maybe we won't have them for long. But be thankful that, you know, you could have been born in a much worse country. You could have been born in a Muslim country. You could have been born in an in a impoverished country. You know, start, I mean, 
are you, are you even are you grateful that you that you live in this country? You're able at least to have the opportunity to work and to thrive, even though it's not perfect. First Timothy two. I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. All right, there's that giving of thanks for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. This is the goal. We just want to live at peace amongst our fellow man. Right? So we want to live at peace. You know, with, uh, with our Christ. So it's obviously our country is not perfect. There's a lot of problems. You know, and I have plenty of things to complain about too in our country. But that doesn't mean we don't want to be thankful for the things that we do enjoy. The fact that we are able to live in a somewhat free country. You know, we're able to walk down. We're able to, you know, worship the Lord without persecution. I mean, you, are you worried about somebody beating you up or killing you for being a Christian? I mean, sometimes we forget about that. You know, we need a bit of persecution in our life. Maybe if we had some real persecution and trials and tribulations for being Christians, maybe you guys would take your faith a little more seriously. Right? We take it for granted. And when we have things that we take for granted we're not grateful for, we don't appreciate, we don't do uh, what we ought to with the things that we've been given. So yeah, it's not perfect, but we, you know, we have the freedom to assemble. We have the freedom to express our faith. You know, maybe not on Facebook, on Twitter, but you, know, you can do it, in the, do it in the streets and whatnot. We can go and preach the gospel and nobody's throwing us in prison for doing that yet. You know, the freedom to go soul winning. You know, we have the freedom to go soul winning now. Are you going to do it while you have the opportunity? Because I tell you what, if you don't do it when it's legal, you're not going to do it when it's illegal. You know what I mean, if you can't, if you, like the Bible says, if you can't run with the footmen, how are you going to contend with horses? If you can't do it now, you can't serve God now when it's easy, how are you going to do it when it's hard? You're not going to be able to. You won't. That's the problem. That's why. Do it now while it's easy. Get in the habit of doing it. Then when it's hard, you'll be able to do it as well. Acts 22. Look at this. Acts 22, 25. As they bound him with thongs, so these are just like, it's kind of like ropes, right? Not like what you think of a thong, you know? He hasn't got Havanas all around him. He's got Havanas. Paul said unto the centurion that stood by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman and uncondemned? So you see how Paul was a Roman citizen? When the centurion heard that, he went and told the chief captain, saying, Take heed what thou doest, for this man is a Roman. So you see how as a Roman citizen he had certain rights. Just like in Australia, as Australian citizens, we have certain rights. Then the chief captain came and said unto him, Tell me, art thou a Roman? He said, Yea. And the chief captain answered, Look at this. With a great sum obtained I this freedom. And Paul said, but I was free born. What is he talking about here? Because the centurion saying, hey, you're a Roman? And the centurion saying, you know, I had to pay a lot of money to have this privilege, to have these freedoms in Rome. And Paul said, well, he was born a Roman citizen. Right? I was free born. So are you, that's what I'm saying. When you're grateful for being born in this country, you may not be a citizen of this country, but for those of you who are, are you grateful that you are? You enjoy some freedoms that others don't and you didn't even have to pay for it. Do you know how much it costs to become an Australian citizen, to get the visa? I mean, back when my wife had to, got the spouse visa, it cost me like three and a half grand, passed all the paperwork. Now I think it's like 10 grand. Some people it's even more expensive depending on your situation. Those people can relate to this when they say, with a great price obtained I this freedom. And you, if you were born in this country, got it for free. Are you happy? Are you, are you grateful for that? Are you thankful that you're born in this country? Yeah, it's not perfect. You know, you're grateful for the opportunity as citizens to be involved in the political process. So we have the legal ability in this country to influence the political process. And a lot of people don't get involved in it, unfortunately. They don't do anything to make this. Unfortunately, a lot of Christians don't even believe we should be involved in politics. You know, we want to be a salt and light in the world. And here is the government saying, okay, we'll give you a legal avenue to inject some salt and light into this world. And then Christians go, well, we shouldn't be involved in politics. Politics is just a legal avenue to change laws and to influence the society. So rather than just doing it by influence and not by, you know, uh, by law, you know, in our country, in a democracy, and as its citizens, you're allowed to participate in this political process. So Christians ought to get involved where they can to make a difference. You know, our country is getting worse and worse 
and it's not just because of the global conspiracies. You know, it's, yeah, are there global conspiracies going on? Yes. But is that the only reason why it's getting worse and worse and accelerating at the pace it is? You know, I think a lot of the reason why our country just gets worse and worse and worse is because the Christians in Australia, the Christians that are called to righteousness, called to make a stand, are too busy with life, too busy with the cares and the thorns of this world that they're not out there making a difference. Hey, the left, hey, the left has time to get involved in politics. The homosexuals have time to get involved in politics. The people that hate Christianity and the Muslims, they've got time to get involved in politics. But what are Christians doing? Christians are too busy going on holiday, too busy like just working to build a bigger house and planning for that next vacation, living it up, you know, traveling around and just living up life. I mean, how many Christians are even involved in the political process? I mean, to my own shame as well, even only now am I getting involved in it. But how many of us are, are just ignorant about how it even works? You know, this is why I'm trying in our church to try and educate people on how it works so that we can make a difference. And in some places, you can ask some of the other, you know, we, we've made a bit of a difference, right? In some of those, some of those places, right? You know what I'm talking about, Gia? I'll tell, you, I'll, talk to you, I'll tell you guys about it later. We're making it so different. So, well, what are Christians doing? You know, yeah, and you know, this is, this is the sad irony of it all. The sad irony, irony of it all is of all the Christians that I've spoken to that say getting involved in politics doesn't make a difference. If they were all involved in politics, it probably wouldn't make a difference. You know what I mean? There's so many people out there saying getting involved doesn't make a difference, and yet if all of them were involved it would probably make a huge difference. I've talked to the people that are involved, quite involved in the political world in terms of how things work in the background and all that sort of stuff. And one of the guys told me, look, if you just had a hundred people working in an area, you would like cause waves within the major parties. A hundred people, you know what I mean? So the people are there, the harvest is plenty, it's like soul winning, but the laborers are few. And you know how many Christians are just like comfortable with mediocre Christianity, where Christians might be in a church that is doing nothing for God, doing nothing impacting society, but you know, they got friends there, they're comfortable, but yet you're there supporting them with your presence, supporting them with your resources, and they're happily being there. I mean, how many Catholics and Orthodox and Protestants have you met? They're not, they know their church is not doing anything, but that's where they still go. Like, get into a church that's doing things, get into a church that's making a difference. It wants to make a change in this society. And if more Christians got into those churches, then there'd be more of a difference made in society, right? Because we'd be together. We're stronger together than apart. Life, health, necessities, country. Number five is, are you thankful for church? Are you thankful that you have a church to go to? First Timothy 3, these things write unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. I mean, I don't know about you, but I remember a time in my life before I, could go, before I went to a church that I could really get behind, that I was happy to go to, that I believed in the things that they were teaching and the things that they were doing. You know, I hope... You know, you guys in this room appreciate that this church exists. I mean, I mean, do you ever go back in your mind to those days where you didn't have a church? And how, like, you didn't have somewhere to call home? You didn't have somewhere to belong? You know, you're in a church that's, like, you know, preaching, like, the wrong gospel or believing certain things that are not biblical. You know, and you came to church and you felt refreshed. You know, and you're like, man, it's like somewhere I can feel normal where people believe the right things and we're teaching the right things, we're, we're going soul winning, we're preaching the gospel. You know, here I can talk about the Bible, there's people here that care about the things of God. That's the sort of place I want to create at our church. But you know, it's only going to be that place if you are that type of people. You know, yeah, I try and set the example. I want to get us thinking about the things of God. I want to get us our minds on serving God. But you know what? If you don't change, then the church is going to be a worldly church. Right? We don't want our church to be worldly. We want our church to be a church that loves God, wants to do things for God. And we have to be that if we want our church 
to be that. But do you remember what life was like before you were at this church? You know, we didn't have somewhere to go. Hear the word of God. Well, you know, hopefully, you know, you hear my sermons and you think, amen. You know, it's good. I like hearing the Bible preached. I like hearing the truth proclaimed. You know, many people don't enjoy that. Many people don't have a church to go to. Many people don't have a bishop in the area setting things in order, preaching the Bible. They have to go every week or they're not going every week and they're like always cringing every time they hear the sermon because it's like things are not biblical. So hopefully, hopefully you don't feel that way about my preaching. But if you don't, if you, don't you know, if you feel you know, this is a place to be, be thankful for that. Because you've got a place where you can feel normal. You've got a spiritual home. You know, you come to church. You're reminded that you're not alone in this battle. You know, that gives you boldness when you go out there. And sometimes when you go out, you know, it's like, uh, you know, this is why it's so important that I think parents are close to their children so that children don't get caught up in the wrong crowds because often when you have a place to call home, some stability, you're not worried so much about what others think about you because you know somewhere where there are people that love you. There are people that appreciate you. You have friends. You, know, you have friends, you have a family here. Right? So when you go out, you're not worried so much about being accepted by the world. Because right? if you don't have a church, then you, you might have to try and be accepted amongst people that are less than ideal. And hang, you know, because you want some company. Whereas here, you have people that believe the right things and are trying to live for God you know, to, to associate with. So you're reminded that you're not alone. You know, that breeds boldness as well. Breeds boldness. But you know what? Hebrews 10, you need to be in church to benefit. You know, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And you see, it is such a blessing to have a church, even for myself as well. You know, I thank God. You know, I look around the room and you know, I think like, you know, I don't know where all you guys came from. You know, like, you know, just thank God that over the years he's built uh, this group of people uh, people that I can truly call my friends. And, you know, you guys are the ones I hang out with. You know, when I, when I have social events and things like that, it's because I want to hang out with you guys. But, um, you know, I thank God for this. I thank God that we have somewhere to go. We can hang out with, that, that you're all here. And, you know, it wasn't always like this. We didn't always have this body that we could be a part of. So I thank God for that, even for myself and for my family as well. So uh, give thanks that you have a church. Be thankful, number six. Be thankful for family. For family, I'm talking about wife, children, you know, brothers, sisters, parents. Be thankful for your family. Uh, I'm going to talk about specifically from my point of view because I'm, you know, I'm just applying uh, the things that I'm thankful for this morning. But I'm thankful that you have, or you have a wife and you have children. Uh, sometimes we take our wife, we take our spouses, we take our children for granted. You know, we don't appreciate the things that they do for us. We don't realize what they do for us until they're no longer there. <laughs> you know, maybe they go on a holiday for a long time, maybe they're sick. You know, then you appreciate what they do for you. You appreciate your children. You, you, sometimes you get frustrated with them, you don't want them around, but then when they're not around, you miss them. You know, you, I, I know myself, you know, one of my children was, you know, God forbid, not with us anymore. You know, it'd be like a piece of your life that can, can never be replaced, you know. Genesis 2, verse 18. The Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. All right? So be thankful that we have family. Proverbs 18. Whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favor of the Lord. I mean, those of you who are married, do you ever think back, you know, at the life before and think what it was like to be single? Would you ever want to go back to that life? <laughs> like hopefully you think you don't want to go back to life. If you, if you ever do want to go back to that life, obviously you're not doing marriage correctly. If you're doing marriage right according to the Bible, you know, and hopefully that uh, movie we watched, you know, Fireproof Help, give you the right sort of mindset to have like a, a serving in your marriage and not even getting anything back in return. If you have that sort of mentality, then you have a good marriage. And if you have a good God-glorifying marriage, it's something to be thankful for. It's a beautiful thing. It's a blessed, blessed thing. And, uh, you know, you never want to go, I never want to go back to those days of being single. I don't want to go through the dating process again and trying to find somebody that you're compatible with. Oh, it's a nightmare. You know, I feel for the singles in our church that have to go through that, you know. And that's why I try and hook them up if you can. Keep your eyes out, guys. <laughs> Help them out. <laughs> all right? <laughs> so I'm thankful for all that Elizabeth does for me. You know, I'm thankful for my wife, thankful for my children. 
You know, I see them here. Sometimes when, uh, you know, I just had Hannah in the back there. You know, sometimes, uh, you know, when I talk to people and then, you know, their jaw drops when they realize I've got six children. Six children. You know, six. You know, you know the thing they always ask me, and I'm sure you guys as well, with more children get it. It's like, so are, you, is, are you done? You know, they always say that. Are you done? Are you going to stop at six? And I just think, like, I don't, if, if, if it's like, have you made enough money? You know, people that like money, you had enough? You know, so it's like people value things. They don't just stop when they think it's valuable and they like it's like I love my kids. I enjoy them, you know, I like having them around. You know, Simon sometimes he's a little bit cheeky, but I wouldn't I wouldn't change him for the world. Right? So I love my kids. I appreciate it. I love you know, you raise them, they're a blessing. Why wouldn't I want more? You know, look at Hannah at the back. You know, it's just chubby little thing. She's like, no, no, no. If you've held her, you want to squish her. Like, wouldn't you want that again? So, you know, it's, you're thankful for these things. Be thankful for your children. You know, and, uh, you know, Psalm 127.3. Look, low children are in heritage of the Lord. And the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. See, we want as many arrows as we can. Right? It's easy to have children. Not so easy to raise them. That's why. We think of them as an arrow. We want to sharpen these arrows, so that when we send them into the world, they can do a lot of damage to Satan's kingdom. But you know what? If you raise your children and you're just blunting that arrow, worldliness, you know, not making sure they're serving God, you know, you're not going to church making sure they're serving God, you're not serving God, having that example for them, if you're not sharp, you know, iron sharpens iron, you're going to send this blunt arrow into the world. You know what I mean? It's probably going to do more damage than good. So are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies at the gate. All right, so don't take your family for granted. Don't take your children for granted. It's easily, easy to take them for granted. Give thanks for them and appreciate them. Raise them in the ways of the Lord. Number seven, two more. Number seven, something to be thankful for. So we're talking about things to be thankful for. Number seven is the Bible. Number seven is the Bible. Second Peter 1. We have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well, that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. You see, Peter here, he saw a vision in the Holy Mount. And you would think he would value that more than anything. But no, he says, we have a more sure word of prophecy. Here. Uh, where did he go? Well, please. Verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. So even more sure than what he saw with his own eyes, he has the word of God. And we have that today. So, you know, we live in a day, an age, where we can search the Scriptures daily at the push of a button. Do you know Christians throughout time did not have the whole Bible? Especially in the Old Testament, they didn't have the New Testament. But even Christians living in the New Testament, they didn't always have all of the Bible. And yet you have it. You carry it around in your pocket. You can search it instantly. And yet how often do you read it? How often do you use it? How often do you cherish what you have today? Do you give thanks for what you have today? We live in the information age. It's so easy to learn things. Abundance of videos on YouTube. You want to learn about any topic, you go on YouTube, you search it, it just pops up. You can learn about anything you want. Right? Do you appreciate what you have? Look at a verse in Acts 17, verse 10. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming there, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. So this is the Bereans here. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind 
look at this, and search the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Now, when we think of searching the scriptures daily, we think of plugging a few search terms into a search engine daily. No, these, this is not what these guys are. These guys are actually you know, probably under candlelight, searching through manuscripts, reading them, finding, hey, did what I hear today at church, what I heard the apostles preach, is that actually what the scriptures teach? Now, you can do that as a, at the push of a button, but do you? Do you receive the word like you're hearing today with all readiness of mind and then search the scriptures daily whether these things are so? You can do it so easily. But do you? Give thanks for the fact that we have the Bible at our fingertips. We don't, need, we don't even need to work at translating the Bible into our own language. I mean, people have already died doing that for us. Do we even appreciate that we have it in English? We have it in a way, we just read it and understand it. It's right there for all of it. We don't have to risk losing our lives to access and distribute the Word of God. We have it in one volume. It's referenced into chapters and verses for us. It was not always like that. But yet we have that today, right? Where we can find, we can pinpoint verses because we have verses and chapter references today. And the last one, and the obvious one, we ought to be thankful for, is our salvation. We ought to be grateful for our salvation. And probably this is the one thing we take for granted the most, if we're saved. You know, that we, we just know that we're saved, and we go about our lives complaining and murmuring, not realizing that we have salvation. And the great thing about the promise of salvation is that we know if we lose everything else, we would always have salvation. First John 5, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record, that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you, that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. So salvation is not by works. Salvation is not trying to earn your way to heaven. It's just receiving the Lord Jesus Christ, the grace through faith. And once you do that, that moment you are saved. That's why this is present tense. If you have the Son, you have life. If you have not the Son of God, you have not life. And the life is eternal. It's not temporary. So once you receive Jesus as your Savior, you call upon Him, asking to be saved, you receive eternal life that moment. And from that moment, you are saved forever. That's the salvation we have, and we can rejoice in that. We can know that no matter what happens in this world, like Romans 8 talks about, nothing is able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. First John, uh, Luke 10, look at this. And we, we, we talked about this passage at another time. But let's read it again. The 70 returned again. These are the 70 apostles that Jesus sent out, not, uh, not necessarily the 12. And they had power over devils with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Right, right day, Satan, we're going to win this battle. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding, in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. You see how we should be grateful and we should be thankful and we should be rejoicing that we are saved. But often we rejoice about the things that are temporary. I mean, these guys are not even rejoicing about the things that are temporary. They're rejoicing about having the power to cast out devils, right? Having the power that the devils are even subject to them. And Jesus says, hey, rejoice rather that your names are written in heaven, that you are saved. So even if we lose everything else, we still have this. But not only do we have, guys, in our salvation, not only do we have the fact that we are saved from an eternity of hell, saved from that punishment, and that's, that's enough to be eternally grateful for. 
But you know, all the things that come along with your salvation. You know, the Bible says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Yeah, we get the privilege to be able to say, Abba, Father. You know, that we can call. We can, the, the fact that we are able to pray to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, this is a privilege that we have that we take for granted. That the God of the universe, we are able you know, to pick up the spiritual phone and talk to him, and he hears us. Right? Are you grateful for that? So not only our salvation from the, the punishment of hell, but also looking forward to heaven and all the things that we will inherit with that. I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven, and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. What a day to look forward to. You can sit down with the God of heaven, and you can talk with him. All the things you're wondering today, you can ask him about. Wouldn't that be a great place? That's what we can look forward to. This is what we got with our salvation, guys. Be grateful for it. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the water of the, fa of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh. Right? Who is he that overcometh the world? Right? It's even our faith. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. So you ought to thank God for that. So it's not only, when you think about your salvation, it's not only being saved from the eternal punishment right it's not only being saved you know even you know one day we're going to be overcome the power of sin and the presence of sin one day but all the things that we will inherit inherit being children of god we ought to be grateful for now i want to end on this thought so we talked about eight things to be thankful for and i hope today was an encouraging sermon for you you know be thankful for your life the health you enjoy your basic necessities, the country you were born in, the fact that we have a church to fellowship in, our family, that we have access to the Word of God easily, electronically, and our eternal salvation. But I want to end on these two verses. First of all, Romans 12. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Reasonable service. See, as we reflect on the things that we're grateful for this morning, do you understand a bit more now why it's reasonable that you serve the Lord Jesus Christ for all he's done for you? It's your reasonable service to present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God. You know, I've often heard the joke that the problem with a living sacrifice is it keeps crawling off the altar. Right? It keeps getting away from where it should be. Right? We're a living sacrifice. Why? Because we ought to be dead to sin, dead to self, but alive to God. And what I want to challenge you on this morning is from Luke 12. Luke 12, verse 47. And that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whosoever, this is the part of the passage I want to focus on. I don't want you to get too focused on, you know, there's consequences, obviously, to our actions. It says here, verse 48, For unto whomsoever much is given of him shall be much required, and to whom men have committed much of him they will ask the more. Now today we ought to be grateful and thankful for the things that we enjoy. So much more than many people in the world 
in terms of physical possessions, our health, our, our freedoms, to be able to serve God and to fellowship and to worship and to preach the word of God and to preach the gospel. So my challenge here this morning is, hey, look at what the Bible said. It says, Whomsoever much is given of him shall be much required. You have been given more than a lot of people in this world and a lot of people in the past. So you know what? God is going to expect more from you. So don't use your life just serving yourself. Use your life to serve the Lord. He expects a lot from us. Think about how much we've been given. All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much uh, for your word. Uh, Lord, thank you for the reminder this morning to serve you. And uh, Lord, thank you just for so much that you've given us. Lord, even if we had nothing, we have you. And your grace is sufficient for us. And uh, not only that, Lord, not only the grace, your love, your sacrifice to save us, but Lord, all the things we're going to get in heaven as your children. We look forward to that day. Lord, help us not to have our hearts set on the things of this world, the things that are seen. Help us to set our hearts on the things of eternity. And uh, Lord, we pray that you would help us to use our life to serve you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.